we good now? Okay. In your bulletin this morning, you have three uses for this thing, this card, this connection card. One is so that, okay, four. One is if you're a member and you weren't here for Sunday school, you can fill it out, put it in the plate. Two is if you are a male and you want to go to the men's prayer breakfast on Saturday, you'll notice on the back there's a box for you to check. Three is if you're a guest and you really want, to, you want us to know who you are. And then fourthly, if you are female, so there's no ambiguity in that in here right now. Uh, we do know who the males and the females are, so we trust that you also know. And if you are female, we'd like to get your card so that we can have a drawing at the end of today's service. We have three gifts to give out. And so if we pull out a name and it's a male, you're not going to get one of these prizes, okay? It just so happens. I don't know if uh, you, anyway, that's just how it works. We're just not doing it. So if uh, you'll fill that out, then I'll ask the ushers, wherever they are, to make sure that we get these cards. Joe, I don't see Tommy sitting in here right now, so if you could make sure that he knows we need all the white cards. There you are. Hi, Tommy. Um, I don't, I don't know how I missed you. The, the, uh, we'll need these before, uh, before the message, maybe, before the sermon. So thank you. All right, why don't we have a word of prayer? But before we do, who has a guest they'd like to introduce this morning? Anybody have a guest that they would like to introduce to the church this morning? Go ahead there, Brother Denny. You got to stand, though. Welcome, Joyce. We're glad you're here. Anybody else? Yes, let's see in the back. Go ahead, Sam. Welcome. Glad you're here. <laughs> Who else has a guest they'd like to introduce this morning? Today. <laughs> Say it again. We need... You and Maddie's friend Noah's here. Noah, why don't you stand so we can make sure that... Good to see you. (laughs) Who else has a guest they'd like to introduce? All right, for just a moment, choir, for just a moment, would you sit down for just, in, in, if you had, it looks like you have a front row there. And I'd like you, if you are a mother, if you are a mother, I'd like for you to stand, please, so we can clap for you and thank God for you. Look at these, yes. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, you may be seated. We were going to give a prize out for the oldest mother, but she wins every year, so we decided not to. Just just kidding. Why don't we have a time of prayer here, and let's be be mindful of those uh, in our uh, congregation that have lost mothers recently, and uh, be in prayer for them as well. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship together today. Thank you so much for each person you've brought into this congregation. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to enjoy good weeks together. Some are sick, not well today, and they're not with us. We think particularly of, uh, of Dorothy, who's not feeling well, hasn't been feeling well for some time. Think of Rita, who is also not with us today. I pray that you would be with, um, I pray that you'd be with Mike, who has surgery tomorrow, that you would uh, superintend on the doctors as they operate on our brother. I pray that you be with, uh, with uh, Roy and Barbara as they travel tomorrow to a funeral and uh, for, for Barbara's brother. I pray that you'd be with the family as they mourn his death but rejoice in heaven's gain. Thank you so much for giving us the assurance that our loved ones know you. And I pray that you'd help us to be ever mindful of the fact that some do not and that we should be praying for them and seeking to evangelize and, and help them into the kingdom. I pray that you'd be with uh, our folks who have said goodbye to their family, to some parents in recent days. Uh, I think particularly of Dawn, and uh, I think of uh, Robinette, I think of uh, Dee Dee, and uh, and Mike, and Bobby Austin, and Shannon and Sean, and I think of uh, Julie Baker, and Linda Klein, I think of uh, Dot Myers, probably 18 months ago. Uh, People who have, uh, and Beth, of course, Beth Pruitt most recently, who have lost their mothers recently in this life. But most of them, to my knowledge, believe that their mothers were born again. And for that reason, we are grateful that they are enjoying Mother's Day in heaven. 
Lord, we thank you that there's not a single one lost that's been given to the Son by the Father. We're so grateful that you've done a good job of saving souls. I pray that you be glorified, Lord, in uh, the service today, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand together as we worship the Lord.
There's got to be a there's there's got to be a way that we can finish that song is incredible. I just I want to go outside and run a while. I don't. Uh, that's awesome. I don't even know how to follow that up. Let's take up an offering. How about that? Let's have an offering. Ushers, come on. And Matt, where are you at, brother? Matt Crate, would you come on up here and join me, please? I don't know where he is. There he is. And uh, we want to make sure that we're continually praying. I want to make sure that I mention it now so that I don't forget later when we pray over the babies and the parents. But we need to be praying for May Benfield. I feel pretty certain May will be graduating to glory here in the next several days. And as you know, her son, daughter-in-law, niece, her family, of course, grandson, granddaughter-in-law, if that's even a term. Great-grandchild, Canaan, will be dedicated today. Um, you know, May is just a, I just love that lady. For almost two years, I've been able to be her friend and her be mine. My wife and I just love going to see her. We need to be praying for the family, okay? And uh, they're strong, but they need our prayers. Matt is going to Honduras this week on a missions effort. What day will you be leaving? Uh, fly to Houston Thursday night, then we head to Honduras Friday and do the medical stuff from what will be Saturday to the Wednesday. And if you remember his report to us Sunday night ago, almost two years, was, no, it was last August, wasn't it? Well worth your time to hear his report when he returns to give us all kinds of data and statistics. Uh, Walter and Sue, would you come up here and help me pray for your son? And uh, if any of you would like to join us and laying hands on Matt as we send him to Honduras this week, please join us now. And you can represent the church, but we want to get mom and dad up here. Amy, are you with us? If you'd like, you can join us as well. Bring your boys if they're with you. If they want to help pray for dad, that's fine. You can even bring Lindley if she's back there somewhere. But we want to make sure that we send this brother off. How many of you promise? I'm talking about promise. I mean, tie a thread around your finger if you must. How many of you promise you'll pray for this man every day of that mission? Let me see your hand raised. Very good. That's wonderful. The rest of you, his name is Matt Creighton, okay? And I hope you'll pray for this brother. Amen. So we're going to pray for him. We're going to ask God to bless his journey. How many of you know that it should not be taken for granted when you take off, fly, and land safely? How many of you know that's a gift from God? Can I see your hand? Yeah. And, and then also, Honduras. How many of you are aware that that's not exactly like Hickory? It, there's, there's some things that are different, and he's going to need some prayers. There's going to be evangelism that takes place along with his work. If you didn't know, Matt is a urologist. He's a skilled surgeon. He works hard in this town to keep the testimony of Christ. And so we want to make sure that we, we pray for him. Join me, please. My Lord, thank you for Matt Creighton. Thank you for his family that's here. Thank you for the opportunity to see one of Sandy Ridge Baptist Church's small group leaders and men of God go out and represent us, yes, and represent you. I pray that you'd keep him safe. I pray that you'd protect his mind and his heart and those on his team. I pray you'd protect his, we know he's skilled, yes. We know that he's educated, sure. We know that he's, he's talented, sure enough. We know he has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, but oh Lord, I pray that you would guide his hands and that you would bless him with words to say in difficult times and that you'd bless him and encourage him and bring us safely back to us. Help his wife and children to know, as they typically do, that dad is in better hands wherever he's at in the will of God more than he is here. We know that you're able to keep him. We know that you're able to protect him in every facet, and I do thank you, Lord, for having Matt as a part of this church body and having him witness, oh God, to Central America on our behalf. We are a rich people. Thank you so much for Matt. I pray you bless he and his team. I pray that all their supplies will be at the right place at the right time. And I pray that you'd help them to be free from injury and disease. 
uh, all pests and pestilences, keep them from them. For those who are seeking to do them harm in the cause of Christ, I pray that you'd keep them at bay. Keep them from harm and alarm for your great namesake. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And now, Lord, I ask you to bless this offering, the gift, the giver, and each grieving heart in this congregation. Be with May Benfield in her closing days, and I pray that you would glorify yourself in that dear sister. And we'll thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matt. That could not be hid. John saw a city. Oh, yes, he did. John caught a glimpse of a golden throne. Tell me all about it. Go right on around the throne. He saw the crystal sea. There's got to be more. What will it be? I want to go. That city he saw near Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden, and I want to run where the angels have trod. Lay down by the lamb. I want to know everything about that lamb. John saw the day, but he did not see night. The lamb of God, well, he must be the light. He saw the saints worship in the great I am. Crying worthy, worthy is the lamb. I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden. And I want to run where the angels have tried. On the banks of your river, in that city, city of God.
Dear Lord, we thank you so much for meeting us here this morning. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to thank you for the mothers that are here and for the mother's love. Lord, it's unbelievable to me that no matter how much a mother loves their children, you love us more. We thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you go with us the rest of the service, the remainder of the service, and that you would open up hearts and minds if there's anyone here that does not know you, that they come to know you today. Amen. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you for that, Keith. I appreciate the prayer. Uh, my wife and uh, children and I, in 2007, had the misfortune of being stationed in Hawaii. And um, somehow, I can't remember what it was for, I know, just keep in prayers, we're still suffering from PTSD from our time in Hawaii. Very difficult at any time you want to, drive out of the clouds to a beach and... Um, so when someone said, ah, you've lived in Fayetteville 12 years, you've been to the, the beach yet? I said, I'm sorry. It, that's, the beach here is a little different. Um, I don't know if I'm qualified to be a beach snob, but in Hawaii, it's just a little different. And once you've been there, I remember Leah was, um, how old, Nikki, when we went to Sarasota for, I can't remember, she was maybe six, six or seven and we walked over the crest of the beach there at, uh, in Sarasota or Inglewood. And on the Gulf side of the peninsula, if you go at the wrong time of year, there's going to be lots of weeds and broken shells washed up on the beach. And Leah's used to Waianae or Waimea Bay on the north shore of Oahu. And we lived there almost a year and a half. And she Crest, she's really excited, you know, got the blow-up stuff on her arms, I think, if memory serves, got a towel ready, walks up over to the crest and says, what is this? <laughs> That's kind of the opposite of what I hope to convey today. While we were in processing there in Hawaii, they make you go through all these organizations to help you be a strong army family. And uh, one of the things we picked up it was a magnet that went on a refrigerator, and Bethany, our oldest, and I constantly made fun of it. It was uh, 50 ways to praise a child. 50 ways to praise a child. So they're trying to get you to be pro-family and have a healthy family environment, which I am for. And uh, there's a lot of ways on here you can praise your child. Dynamite! That's one of them, okay. Groovy, son, groovy. It's a little strange. Uh, Nice work. Uh, I knew you could do it. That's 50 ways to praise a child. 50 ways to praise a child. In other words, if, you're, if you are struggling with finding other ways to say good job, then you have 49 other ideas. Uh, far out. That seems a little dated. Uh, maybe just a little dated. Far out might be something my mother would say. Um, but, you know, not, you know, that was smart. I mean, that, that's a little dated, too, if you can go back to uh, that show, that cop show. Anyways, we, we learned how to be uh, creative in the way that we praise our kids. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're told for our purpose of being here. Uh, if you would, please, look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Are you a saint this morning? Have you put your faith in the gospel? Well, then this is to you. If you've been born again, if Jesus is your Savior, then what we're reading is a letter to you, a letter to me. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. So I will immediately admit that at first glance, this is just a letter to some saints that lived in another place at another time and they are generally of another ethnicity. But the reality is this has been preserved for us so that you and I would benefit from it on this May 13th, 2018. I can't decide which shocks me more, the fact that it's May or the fact that it's 2018. But the reality is 
Here we read in verse two, grace to you. You have received grace, peace from God. We talked about that last week. And from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, you need to stop there and think to yourself, do I believe that? Do I believe that? Have I really been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heaven? Have I really? If so, I would like to know the nature of these blessings. Well, we've, we've talked about that to some degree. Verse 4, here's one of the blessings. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, here, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Or you might have a version that says, to the praise of his glorious grace. Maybe we should define a few terms here so that we don't get lost. Grace is unmerited favor. It is a a favor done for us or done to us that we simply don't deserve. Does everyone understand that? Do we get that? Uh, yes, we could put a handy little acronym up there, but, but I don't want us, for, for the help of God's riches at Christ's expense, forget that each word has a meaning. And not only does it have a denotation or a dictionary meaning, it has syntax. And what that is, is it means it has words that relate to it around it. And so we're not free to just say, God's been gracious to me, and then be done with it. No, we're students of the word, and we inform what God has done for us in this grace. And so verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, look here, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Made us accepted is a phrase in the Greek that is only used twice in the entire New Testament. You say, why do you say it that way? Well, because translations in the English can be different. But I just want us to point out, please, that acceptation or being accepted, once again, can probably best be demonstrated if you've ever sold a book on Amazon. If you list a book today on Amazon.com, there's a strong chance that when you do, if it's a used book, you'll be able to select the condition of the book. Usually, you have several conditions to pick from. I'm thinking of five. New, like new, very good, good, and acceptable. Then poor. In other words, acceptable is usually a term that we use when we're talking about something that has real shortcomings, but we'll take it. I've demonstrated it previously in here before as that some of you grade papers. You are professionals at grading papers, teaching, giving instruction, some in science, some in shop, some in history, some in math. You're great at what you do. And to be honest, if you made the student live up to your standard that you needed for your master's degree or your bachelor's degree, it would never be acceptable. But when they perform at a level that's decent for them, you say, I'll accept that. See, in this scripture, we have a real dilemma, and I'm going to keep saying it. In our culture today, brothers and sisters, we have this kind of two-step Christianity. Really, we should see ourselves as people who are being continually discipled all the way through the first time we hear the gospel, all the way through to when we believe the gospel, all the way up to when we have enough allegiance in our Lord to get baptized and join with his body and so forth, all the way up to when we wind up in heaven looking like we belong there. That is called discipleship. Discipleship is not step two. Discipleship is the step. It is being called to follow Christ, and somewhere along the line, you put your faith in him to be saved. When we decide that there is a step called accepting Christ, we are saying that despite Jesus' shortcomings, I guess I'll follow him. When in reality, this verse says, he accepts us. Now, I think what's really important to point out here is that there's reasons why we are thankful for this. But first, before we do that, I need you to see how important this phrase is. You see in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. And then you'll notice in verse number 12, it finishes with, those who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 14, the end of the verse, 
until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I think that you can agree with me, brothers and sisters. I think you can agree with me that if something is used once, we should probably take it seriously if God said it. If it's used twice, we should probably, probably pay good, good attention. If it's used three times, it is negligent to not pay good attention. There's a lot of evidence in the New Testament that they wrote hymns and songs in the first century. One of them is probably found in 1 Corinthians 15, another one probably in Philippians 2. I think here in this passage we have an ancient hymn, and I'll tell you why. If we were to sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms, what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, what comes next? Lean, and that's when it really gets loud because everyone knows those were those words. Leaning, leaning, safe and safe. Then we go, if no one has a hymn book in their hand, and we sing, what have I to dread, what have I to fear? The, no- nose kinda, the noise kind of dies down and everyone hums and sings watermelon for two or three bars and, and we all kind of fake it real good and then we get to the chorus, leaning, all big and pretty like a choir. That's because we know the chorus, we know the refrain. And here we have three times in this passage, we're only going to look at one of them this morning, we have this repeating of a phrase, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. And the last two do not say what the first one did, to the praise of the glory of his grace. But that is all that is required, really, for our praise, or I should say that is all that requires our praise this morning, is his grace. Now ask yourself, are you someone who just hashtags blessed or do you know what it means to be blessed by his grace? When was the last time, in other words, that you applied 50 ways to praise a child to God? Maybe last week, I think it was last Sunday night, we closed our worship service when I said, let's spend three minutes and you tell the Father what you think of him. I wonder if you have ever thought about how your morning prayer time can start with Father, looking out at that son, you did a great job. Heavenly Father, as I look across the horizon in our front yard, as I look over to the chirping birds outside of our window, as I think about most of all your great grace that was imparted to me, I just want to tell you, I think that's super, superb. I think you're excellent, Heavenly Father. We might actually sound like a psalmist. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We ought to probably try to perfect this thing of praising our God. And not just praising him, but being creative in how we praise him. As creative in praising him as we are in being creative in ways in how we offend him. More so. I have two reasons why I think that we ought to give praise to God for his grace And it is because, first of all, we are accepted. We are made accepted. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment, but I'm going to quickly talk to you about God's grace. Number one, it's proactive and not reactive. In this passage of Scripture, you saw it with your own eyes as I was reading it. You have God, verse 3, blessing us with heavenly blessings. Verse 4, when he chose us. Verse 5, when he predestined us. And when did this happen, verse 4? Come on, help me before the foundations of the world. Brothers and sisters, it's not like God looked out over time and thought, let's see, who here is going to believe on me? Ah, 2018, that dude will believe on me. I think I'll be gracious to him. Brothers and sisters, that is not the message of this passage. The message of this passage is that God is gracious to people before they even hatch, before they even have an opportunity to think a Godward thought. He is pouring out his grace on those who he's chosen and those who he's predestined. You say, I don't know if I like that so much. Hey, it just, just keep reading Paul and keep thinking about Jesus in John 6 and keep thinking about, oh, First Peter over there where he says that Christ was preordained before the foundation of the world be the Lamb of God for us. After reading some scripture for just a while, you'll get more and more comfortable with the fact that God was gracious to some before they were even born. The, the reason verse 13 tells us that we are actuating these blessings is because we first trust in Christ. But the reality is we trust in Christ, Ephesians 2.8 says, because even our faith is a gift. Right? For by grace you save through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Our faith is a gift of God, brothers and sisters. 
Uh, In other words, what I'm trying to say is we might rightly bless him is why he did this. So we might praise his glorious grace. We might look to heaven and see the radiance of the plan of God that starts with no time, ends with ages to come, 2-7 says, before the world, 1-4, Till the ages to come, 2-7, and he throws on us lavish amounts of favor, and it wasn't reactive. Child of God, he did not wait to see if you were worthy, because he knew that we were not worthy. So, if this is true, and he was blessing undeserving sinners like us, Allow me to say this applies today. He does today as he did back then. He always sends, are you with me? He always proacts in his grace. The, The fact that if you're saved in here this morning, the fact that he was proactive in his grace and brought you to himself is indicative of the fact that he has a nature that does that. See, God doesn't do what his nature won't allow. The fact that he did it means that his nature is gracious. That means that today, today, God has sent his grace that you need. How how did we get that? Because God's nature requires it. Child of God, you will not have it until tomorrow. But tomorrow's grace is on the way. And it's been on the way for all of human history since before the world began. All that the Father gives, he has always given and always is in the act of giving. Grace is on the way today. And that is why we say, whoo, good job! Because we praise his glorious grace. That's, That's why we're not concerned about whether or not we seem too Pentecostal. Because this is not about whether or not we look Baptist. This is about whether or not we are doing what we were created to do. What an egotistical God. He put grace on us so that we would praise it. I would say that if anyone should be egotistical in human reasoning, it is God. And when I say egotistical, I'm using terms that we are familiar with. If I say that God is God-centered, that seems pretty obvious. But you should take great encouragement today to know that God is not reacting to your life. And why should he? He never has. He has not ever reacted to the sin curse. Read 1 Peter 1.20. Read Revelation 13.8 where it says he was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Do you remember reading that? That means before there was a sin, there was a Savior. Before there was a tree, there was a Savior. Before there was an act of disobedience, there was a Savior. Before there was a garden, there was a Savior. That is our God. So everything that happens to us today does not happen because that kind of implies happenstance. Our great God is proactive in his grace, not reactive. Be encouraged to know that, and then you can understand why we should spend our entire lives finding ways to be creative, to praise our God. Second and lastly, we praise him for his offensive grace. I don't mean offensive grace as in, man, I wish you wouldn't have said that. That was offensive. I mean offensive like my tight ends here would see it. These two bruisers down here, together they weigh 1,700 pounds and they catch footballs and run through brick houses. If I say we can't afford to be defensive, we have to be offensive, they get it. We think of offensive in the way that it irritates us when someone says something about us or when they small talk with us or whatever. No, God's grace is offensive. He was not on the defensive when he offered, or rather, I would say, use an old word that's worth looking up, proffered grace. He gave, and that's in a hymn that we sing, by the way, grace he proffered. He gave it to us. He was not... He was not defensive in the way that he did it. This is, he, in other words, he's not running away from a burning toaster, unplugging it, running it out of the, running out of the house. He's, 
He's not, he's, uh, maybe this is a better way. He's not throwing on a, a water on a fire as he runs away from it. This is an offensive God. This is a God who is proactive and offensive. He drives our mission. And it changes the way that we witness. It changes the way, listen, it changes the way that we witness. It changes the way we do world missions. We're not going hoping that God chooses some. We're going to find the ones God has chosen. It changes everything. When we look in Revelation 7 and we see that there are people from every kindred, tribe, people, nation around the throne, we realize that world missions is a fixed fight. We have some who are called to go find God's lost sheep. So this being accepted is God's doing. You and I ought to be thankful we've been accepted, not just when it comes to our witnessing world and not just when it comes to our evangelism, but when it comes to, here we go now, parenting. Why do we parent? Moms, why exactly do we parent? Realize this as we look at chapter five, because remember, chapter four, verse one, is the bridge. Chapters 1, 2, 3 of Ephesians, which we've been hearing for seven weeks now, is the doctrine. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 is the so what. And chapter 4, verse 1 is the hint. I therefore, I, I beseech you, I beg you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Does everyone get that? So in chapters 4, 5, and 6, we are seeing what recipients of grace do. All right, so look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Chapter 5, verse 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, but that uh, she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now there's some preaching to be done there, but that's not where we're going to stop. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does. I love that verb, does nourish and cherish the church. Now, verse 30. Now he's right in the middle of an argument, friends for why husbands should love their wives, and wives, you might notice in verse 22, are to submit to their husbands. That's, that's not a chauvinist, that's Paul the apostle. Okay, so verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. And then, if you have a publisher like I do, verse 31 is in italics. If not, it doesn't change the fact that Paul is now quoting out of Genesis chapter 2. Pay, pay attention what he quotes out of Genesis 2. For this reason, a man, for what reason? For, for the reason that a uh, marriage is for the reason to show us Jesus and his church. Verse 31, I want to look at a minor point in the passage. For this reason, a man shall, look here, leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, continue verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. I want to wrap this thing up and just mention, if I could, if you'll notice in this passage, you have mom being mentioned with dad three times. It is on purpose. And the reason that I know that it's on purpose is because in chapter 6, verse 4, you have one of the parents being singled out. Do you see that? If Paul purposefully singled out one of the parents, then you better mark her down that when he includes both parents, he meant to do that as well. So you might notice, I would like to show you two things from the passage as it applies to mother and give you the so what. Number one, mothers are to be a part of launching a son into leading his own home. This is not normal in today's culture. In today's culture, young men get 20 or 30 years to grow up past their normal age. This is going to take hard work. Brothers and sisters, I need you to hear me when I tell you that if this wasn't hard work in Ephesus, if this wasn't hard work in the Ephesian church, Paul would not have talked about marriage. Marriage is pretty hard work. You have one sinner living with another sinner. Yes or no? Now, some of you are bowing your head like I've begun to pray. I haven't begun to pray. The reality is that we're living with another sinner, and I'll just say the right thing. She's living with a bigger sinner than I am. That's the right thing to say, Shannon. I know. I've been in this thing. 
20 years plus now. I know exactly what I'm supposed to say. Now then, now we need to remind ourselves that this scripture that we read for this cause a boy, a young man, a man will leave father and mother and be joined to his wife means that it will probably be a bigger struggle in the church for mamas and daddies to let go of their sons. Now, hear me. Just work with me in the passage. The fact that Paul doesn't quote, forgive me, the fact that Moses did not originally say, for this cause, a father will bless his son to marry a bride, it doesn't say that, does it? Genesis 2 doesn't say that. It says a a man will leave father and mother. She's placed there on purpose for the express purpose of instructing, at least in part, us in realizing that this is a joint effort. Mom, you're raising a man. And you're raising a man to lead his own home. So this, this cannot happen. I'm sure there's no one in the room like this, but maybe... There's this perpetual restraining of the young man from leading his own home. You need to know that this causes a lot of trouble in second generation homes. Probably not in this church, but it does in my experience. How many of you have a mother-in-law? Well, then you probably know, at least in part, what I'm talking about. Probably your mother-in-law is perfect. I know the right thing to say. But remind yourself that a son will treat his wife how he treats his mother. And that is why it's important for us to note that it is an instruction to the mother, at least in part, as much as it is to the father, to expect young man to leave and cleave to a wife. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't talk about a woman leaving her parents because for some reason that seems like it will happen without even mentioning it. But here, here we have an understanding and it's counterintuitive to me. Why a man would struggle leaving mother and father. And I just want to say, mom, if you're raising the future head of a household, you ought to be lauded and praised for what you're doing. But the reason why a lot of mothers don't realize that they're doing this thing is because to them, the end-all, be-all is having that little boy in their clutches that they will always have. And no doubt, savor those years where you get to go to ball games and love that little man. But eventually, moms, we have to see that these little men we're raising are going to hopefully lead a woman and children into nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I know some of you are going to be tempted to be frustrated with me because I'm not addressing single-parent homes. Allow me to do that quickly and say that is exactly why churches ought to be coming to the aid of single mothers. Because if dad isn't there to, to support the role, the nurturing role, the raising role of the mother, we are in deep trouble. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. This is the second thing I want you to notice. Mothers are to expect obedience from their children. They're to expect it. There's not supposed to be these debates about why. What kind of world are we raising when we give our children a reason or a right to always question mom? It is ungodly. Dads, we have to make our home a place where it is expected that mom is obeyed, not debated, not whined. No, no, we're not going to allow whining when mom says to do something. If we don't do this, then the previous chapter, verse 31, will be incredibly difficult. He will see mom as someone that he can mooch off of once you pass away. He will see mom as someone that can be bullied into sharing her resources that you leave for her. We've got to make sure that this gets right in the house of God, brothers and sisters. We have to make sure that we understand that it is not natural for our children to obey their parents, let alone honor them after they're out of child-rearing years. But I don't think America is crammed full of people that know how to do this as children of God. I mean, it's probably not news to you, but... It must be demanded. Our children must obey. And listen, it must be supported with groundings, relative deprivations, and if appropriate, sensible and appropriate corporal punishment. So I, I don't know. Look, my daddy beat me with a bow door. Do you think for one minute 
Do you think for one minute that it's going to hurt a child to receive the board of correction on the seat of learning? And I'll tell you this, please hear me, and I'll get off of my little Paul-inflicted soapbox. A young man or woman who struggles with obeying their mother will expect coddling from their teachers and law enforcement and judges and bosses. We are training our children for real life where the bottom line is profit margin, not your baby's feelings. So who do you want to raise your kids? It's incredibly painful if we don't do it. Many of you are doing a fabulous job. I love watching it. We are recipients of grace, and, and, and I love watching it. But if we don't teach this to our kids, verse 3 tells us that they are doomed to a miserable life. Look at it. The idea, the opposite, is that if they don't honor their father and mother, it will not be well with them, and they will not live long on the earth. Isn't that what your Bible says? So, so, so why do we do this? And I'm done. Why do we do this? This is so important. You've got to see this. The reason we do this is not for the purposes that often get pushed on mothers. Let me see if we can make sure that we all get this. Mom, if anyone needs Ephesians 1, 6 this morning, it's you. If anyone needs it on Mother's Day, please hear me. Fine, close your Bibles, unwrap your candy, but listen. If anyone needs Ephesians 1, 6 this morning, it is mom. Because mom wants the babies to keep calling when they leave the house. Mom wants the babies to call when they're at college. Nothing wrong with that. Mom wants the children to always call them first. Nothing wrong with that. But oftentimes, mom, if we don't believe what Ephesians 1, 6 says about us, we won't do Ephesians 5, 31 and Ephesians 6, 1. Here's why. We so badly want to be accepted by our kids. The reality is that we spend our time making parental choices because we want our children to accept us. When the word of God says that we do what we do with our children because he has already accepted us. Ephesians 1, 6 says God has accepted us through his grace and we therefore give thanks to him for the glory or the radiance or the splendor of his grace. Brothers and sisters, what this means is that if mom does not have a secure view of how God views her, she will continue to acquiesce or how do we say capitulate on hard parenting decisions because she so badly wants Junior or Sally, sorry, to come back and always, 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 always accept them and think of them as a great parent. And if we're not careful, this will lead to something even worse. Is everyone still listening with me? This, if we're not careful, this will lead to something worse. It will lead to idolatry. We will ask our children to give us something that only God has provided. Acceptance. And if we put our children in a place where they have to provide for us what only God can provide, that, my friends, is crafting a God of our own choosing. So when we don't believe what God says about us, we are crafting a God that we want. It just, we name them because they're our children. They give us the adoration that we're aching for. They give us the acceptance we're aching for. They give us the drive we're hoping that they get. If they perform well, we feel like great parents. And don't I look like a great parent? If I stink at everything else, at least I'm a great parent. Why? Because my kid is great. But if my kid messes up and I take all of my value, not out of what God has accepted in me and what God has done for me in Christ, but I see all my value in how well of a kid I raise, then if they fall from that pedestal, my God has fallen from that pedestal because they were the one that brought me a feeling of acceptance. I'm asking my children to do what only God can do. And if I see that happening, I see brother so-and-so doesn't have the respect and honor of his kids. Sister so-and-so is grieved that her children are not following Christ. And I don't want that happening to me. I don't want to be known as the preacher that lost his kids to the world. And so I start doing things so that my kids love me and love my religion and love my wife and love my home. And before you know it, I only want what God alone can give me. Acceptance. 
Moms, it is really important that you know how great our God is and how great his grace is and how highly he thinks of you. Child of God, you can get no more promoted than in Christ. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord bless his word. My Lord, I pray that you would encourage us today as we consider the word of God. The men will get their opportunity in a month to hear a specialized message. I'm so thankful that you made it easy on us through the Apostle Paul. Lord, I would ask you, please, here and now, I would ask you to encourage mothers in this room to know that their value does not come from their adult children thinking that they're heroes. Their value comes because God, before the foundation of the world, picked them out to dump grace on them and has selected them to share in his glory to the end of the ages.